Since it is still the Easter season, let's join together in our beautiful shout of affirmation and proclamation both today and every day. So here we go. We're going to put it up on the screen. Ready? I'll say one, you say the other. Just like back in high school. Ready? Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. To all of our friends who are joining us this morning for online worship, we're glad that you're here. For all of our friends who are in the room, we are glad that you're here. I want to give a shout out this morning and just know that we are so honored that you would choose on this beautiful day when you could be doing anything, you're here. You're here to join us for worship. And so if you're online with us today, hey, throw a picture up there of where you're worshiping from and who's worshiping with you today. We'd love to be able to celebrate that with you this morning. And I really want to encourage you, especially for those who are here and online, if today's message is an encouragement to you, like there's something that, that really touches your spirit and really speaks to you where you're at today in your life and walk with God, I really want to encourage you afterwards, share this message uh, just with anybody that you think would be, get, be, a, it would be a blessing to, it would be a benefit to, it would be a source of encouragement to. And if you're in person today, I want to invite you to pull out this little um, goldenrod sheet here, this little handout, okay, and so that you can take some notes and follow along with the scriptures. If you're at home today, you may want to grab your Bible and take some notes there, grab a piece of paper if you want. We're going to put everything up on the screen so you can follow along this morning. Uh, but today, we are continuing with part two of our series called Life, Light, and Love, a deeper dive into the book of 1 John. And 1 John is, is just this beautiful letter of encouragement that John, who is a disciple of Jesus, lived with Jesus, walked with Jesus. He wrote this letter at the end of his life after 50 years of being a disciple. John writes these words. And they are challenging, they are encouraging, they are hope-filled. And what we saw last week, as it sets the stage for this week, is that we have this God who is our life, our light, and our love. We saw last week how Jesus, right, is the giver of life. He gives me life, he gives you life. He's the source of light. He's the one who brings light into our world so that we know the path of righteousness. We know the path that God has designed to, for us to live and walk in in this world. But more than anything, he is a demonstration of love. His love shown for us on the cross as he laid down his life. He is a demonstration of love. And so this week, we're going to continue with part two. And I want to share with you a very simple message called Lessons from Dad. Lessons from Dad. So let's pray and ask the Lord to bless our time together. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this time together. May the word that you speak through your servant, John, be a word of encouragement and hope and grace for us. May that word of encouragement speak to our hearts and fill us with joy and laughter and peace. May, may your word that you speak to us challenge us, but also equip us to follow you as we take these beautiful lessons from dad from, to heart, as we, as we apply them to our life and really sink our teeth into them this morning and every day. And we all said together, both here and at home, amen, amen, amen. There once was a father and a son. And one day, the father and son decided to go out fishing. And father and son are sitting together by the bank, and uh, the boy became curious about the world around him. And as he was looking at the lake, he noticed some boats out there, and he said, Dad, how do boats float? And the father responded very simply, don't write no, son. Don't rightly no, son. So the boy just sat there for a moment, okay, and he began to contemplate life again, turned back to his father, and he said to this, to his dad, Dad, how do fish breathe underwater? Great question for a kid, right? How do fish breathe underwater? And once again, the father replied, don't rightly know, son. A little later, the boy asked another question, Dad, <laughs> we all had this one, why is the sky what? Blue. And dad looked at him and said one more time, don't rightly know, son. Worried, 
the little boy was, that he was annoying his father. He looked at his dad and said, Dad, do you mind that I'm asking all of these questions? And dad looked at him and said, of course not, son. If you don't ask questions, you'll never learn anything. This is what we call a lesson from dad. A lesson from dad. Lessons from dad, as I know and you know and we know, they all come from different places and in many ways, right? Our lessons from dad sometimes are spoken lessons, right? It's words of wisdom and insight and encouragement that our dads, our fathers, whoever that person is in our life, give to us, right? Sometimes those lessons from dad are not spoken. It's just what we see, what we observe what we watch. Sometimes our lessons from dad are very intentional, right? Son, we need to have a talk. Sit down. Daughter, we need to have a talk. Sit down. Sometimes those lessons are unintentional. Like when you're driving to the mall to go get a pair of soccer cleats and all of a sudden a conversation breaks out. Sometimes our lessons from our fathers are good. Sometimes our lessons from our fathers are not so good. We all have lessons from dad. My father taught me some very important lessons. And uh, I hope he's listening up in heaven right now. My father taught me, for example, the value of a hard day's work. We lived on a farm. You could not run a farm without working hard. But not only did my dad have a farm... He also had two other businesses to go along with the farm in the off-season, a janitorial business and a supply business. My dad was always working, and he taught me from very early the value of a hard day's work. My dad taught me the value of the importance of treating people that you work with and for with honesty and integrity. My dad had this business. It was a janitorial business, and so he had contracts, right? And one thing that I learned from my dad is I watched my dad go about his business. It's not a conversation that he and I had. It's just simply, I watched this. My dad never overcharged anyone. If anything, he undercharged. My dad would never cheat anyone in business. Now, he was never rich, far from it. But every day he went to work, he knew he was always treating people fairly and rightly at fair market value. He always did that. He also taught me the importance of letting your work speak for yourself. (laughs) My dad never really did any advertising. Any advertising he did was terrible advertising. It never drummed up any business whatsoever. All of my dad's business was by word of mouth. All of it. It was word of mouth because of the quality of work. People would see it, they would call him, and they would invite him to come work for him. He taught me the importance of letting your work speak for yourself. My father taught me many other things in life, but that's for a totally different day. We all have lessons from dad. And so it shouldn't surprise us that our heavenly father has some very unique lessons for us today that I really want to invite you to lean in and grab a hold of today. These are lessons for you, they're for your children, they're for your grandchildren, and they will dramatically impact your walk with God today and every day. And so let's take this deep dive together with five lessons from Dad on life, love, and light. Number one, here's lesson number one. You are loved. You are loved. No matter what you do, no matter where you go, no matter what happens in your life today, tomorrow, or the next day, if there's any lesson that your God wants you to know today is that you are loved. And in a world, if you don't understand this, this world is starved for love. It is looking for it, in all, as the song goes, in all the wrong places. This world is starved for love. And this is a lesson that God wants us to have, is that we are loved. Look at 1 John 3, verse 1 with me. Here's what the Bible says. It says, see what, I love this word, great love, right? That, That word in Greek is mega, right? So when you walk into Raceway and you get a mega drink, you know, like it's like 176 ounces of Pepsi or Mountain Dew for some of you, right? 
That's a mega drink, right? Well, God says, listen, I've got mega love for you. I've got great love for you. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to lavish that love on you. I'm going to lavish this love on you that we should be called what? Children of God. How does God show His love for you? He calls you His child. Now, there was some, I was thinking about this this week, right? The human race has given God every reason not to love us. Amen? Think about this. The human race has given God every reason to not love us, right? I mean, we're selfish, we're stubborn, we're sinful, we ignore God, we despise God, we turn our back on God, we even reject God. And yet, God still keeps coming, right? For me and for you. John says it this way, right? Going back to the verse for a moment. He says, you can see it. Circle that word see, right? You can see this great love. You can see this great love that the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that's what you are and that's what I am. Notice, he doesn't call you a reject. He doesn't call you a misfit. He doesn't call you expendable. Your Father in heaven loves you so much that not only does He call you a son and daughter, but He also provides a way for you to be a son and daughter. See, He doesn't just call you a child of God. He actually goes through the process of a formally adopting you into the family so that you are a part of His children forever. Last week, we got to celebrate that with Brady. Look at that, Brady, you're up on the screen today. <laughs> Last week, we got to celebrate with Brady his baptism, where God said, Brady, I am adopting you into the family of God. You are one of my children. You belong to me. Not only do I call you a child, I've made you a child. After this service, Ruth will get that same blessing. As God tells Ruth in the waters of baptism, Ruth, you are my child and you belong to me. You belong to me, right? St. Paul says in the book of Galatians that you are adopted as one of the family. And as part of the family, nothing will ever carry you away. See, your dad wants you to know, and I was thinking about this this week, right? Your dad wants you to know this, that when you wake up tomorrow and you go to work, you're loved. You're loved. When you go to school, Austin, tomorrow, when you walk off that bus and you, you go into school, God wants you to know, Austin, you're loved. You're loved. When you, when you wake up in the morning to take care of your kids, God wants you to know you're loved. When you, when you head off to do whatever you have planned for the day, God wants you to know, say it with me, you are loved. You are loved. And this lesson matters because you're going to need that affirmation because of lesson number two. You need to know that you are loved and that you belong because lesson number two reminds us that life is going to be difficult. So here it is, lesson number two. You will be misunderstood. You will be misunderstood. You know, the first time that I ever went out of the country was on a mission trip to a place called San Lorenzo, Mexico. It was about an hour and a half west of, the, of uh, Juarez uh, on the Texas-El Paso border. And when we got to San Lorenzo, right, we stayed there for about a week, and we got to meet the, the people of the church that we were helping to build. We got to be part of com the community that we were in. And at that time, I knew just a little bit of Spanish. I was a junior um, in, in college but I didn't know enough to have a conversation with someone. So when they got there, it was frustrating. It was frustrating not being able to communicate with the people. It was frustrating not to be able to, to, to have a conversation with the people that we were working with. And so every time I had to be very careful. I had to be very careful about what I said, and I especially had to make sure that I pronounced the word baño correctly. 
Because if I didn't pronounce that word, that one simple word correctly, I would not find the bathroom when I needed it the most. Amen? And so we, the problem was, the problem was, they couldn't understand me. Why? Because I didn't know the language. The same is true for lesson number two. You're going to be misunderstood because people don't know the language. You're going to be misunderstood by the world because they don't know you because they don't know Jesus. Just listen to what John says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. I'll put it up on the screen for you. The reason the world doesn't know us, that means, and, and that word know, is you can place in a, a you know, uh, you can substitute the word understand there, right? The reason the world doesn't understand Christians is because that they don't understand Jesus. Because if you don't understand Jesus, you can't understand his followers. If you don't know him, you can't know the people who follow him, Right? Another way of saying is the reason they can't understand you is because they don't understand him. Let me give you a couple examples to bring this home. Here's the first one. Jesus says, speak truth in love. But what does the world hear? What does the world understand? Jesus says, speak truth in love, right? So, so we go to a friend or we go to a family member or we go to somebody we know, right? And we love them, but we know we have a conversation with them, right? But when we have that conversation, right, if they're part of the world, here's what happens. They don't hear love. They don't hear truth. But what they understand is you're being judgmental. That's what the world understands. The world says you're sticking your nose where it doesn't belong. You're going to be misunderstood when it comes to Jesus on this. Now, if you try to, of course, now listen. If you try to speak to someone that you don't really love, but you're trying to convey truth, and they react negatively to you, that's on you. That's all you. That's your fault, right? Okay? You don't ever go speak a truthful, hard, difficult conversation to someone if you don't genuinely love them. And if you don't love them, then you need to be with God for a little while and let God develop a love in your heart for that person so that when you actually go to them, you can speak honestly truth and love. But understand this. You may be misunderstood. You may be called judgmental. You may be told that this is none of your business. You may be, they may shift the blame onto you. Whatever it may be, you're going to be misunderstood. Number two. Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, right? So, so you think to yourself, I'm going to do something nice for my neighbors, right? Now, in the South, you can kind of get away with this a little bit more, right? But in other places, it doesn't always work this well, okay? But, but, it, but you say, okay, I'm going to bake cakes for every single one of my neighbors, or I'm going to buy dinner for all of my neighbors. I'm going to do something randomly kind for all of my neighbors, right? And you have that one neighbor that goes, what are you doing? What are you doing in this particular moment? Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, and so you do something kind and unexpected. What is the world here? What's the catch? What do you want? What's in it for you? No one can just do something freely out of love. Number three, Jesus says this, forgive as you have been forgiven. And so somebody has wronged you. Somebody has done something hurtful. Somebody has done something that has really wrecked your world. And you go through the process of forgiving them, right? You go through the process of forgiving them. The world hears and doesn't understand that. And so what do they say? There's no way you could have forgiven them. There's no way. I'm going to hold on to a grudge. There must be something you're going to get revenge on them. There must be something you're looking for from them, right? Rather than simply be forgiven. When you begin to live as children of life, light, and love, understand this. You will be misunderstood. But be encouraged. That despite that misunderstanding, or maybe yet worse, persecuted, this life is only beginning. God has something better for all of us, which brings us to lesson number three from Dad. And here it is. You have more to come. Your best days are still ahead of you. 
Your best life is still ahead of you. If you think this is the best, you're missing out because there's something even more. You know, one of the most popular home renovation TV shows um, is on HGTV, right? And it's called Fixer Upper. I don't know how many of you have ever watched the show Fixer Upper, right? It's a very popular TV show, right? And it was created by this couple, Chip and Joanna Gaines, right? And the premise of the show is real simple, right? You buy a house, they're going to fix it up for you, and then they're going to have what's called the big reveal, right? And at the big reveal, here's a little scene from one of the shows, right? But in the big reveal, what happens is this. They have this portable um, slide that shows your old house, and then on the count of three, Chip and Joanna are going to pull it away so you could see your brand new beautiful house that you're going to live in, right? It's called the great reveal, right? It's the big reveal, right? And when it's revealed, right, what happens? The family, the couple, whoever bought the house, man, they are ecstatic. They are excited. They are thrilled for the opportunity to see their brand new house, right? This is the way God has for us. This is what God has in store for us. Let's look at it together. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. He says this, Dear friends, right, now we are children of God, right? That's why this is lessons from Dad. Now watch this. What we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. What you are is not what you're going to be. See, right now, I'm in the renovation stage. Right now, friends, you're in the renovation stage. God has purchased the property. He's had demo day. That's your baptism. And now God is in the process of rebuilding you. And you've yet to see the big reveal. You've yet to see what it's going to really be like. You've yet to experience the fullness of this new life with Jesus because he's still in the rebuilding phrase. When Christ appears, right, that's the great reveal day. And we shall be like Him. Why? Because we shall see Him as He is. And we shall see ourselves as we are. Watch this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It becomes extremely real. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says this. I say this at every single funeral. When we're standing beside a graveside, so that the last thing you begin to think about is that even though that grave is going to go into the ground, it's not the end. It's not the end. Watch this. We shall not all sleep. We shall not all die. But we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of the eye, at the last trumpet. Now listen. Tomorrow, if you're at work or you're at school, and you start to hear a very loud trumpet blast all over the city. And you start getting text messages from people in Georgia and Kansas and Alaska that they started to hear a loud trumpet blast. And you start to see on Facebook and Instagram that people in Russia, Australia, South America, and Chile are healing, hearing a large trumpet blast. Here's what you do. Grab your boots. Jesus is coming. Y'all laughing about that, man. No, you just, just hold on tight, okay? Because here's what's going to happen. Jesus is coming, and you better start looking around because you're going to start seeing dead people come out of the ground. Now, here's the cool thing. It isn't going to be walking dead type dead people, okay? It's going to be resurrected new life people, right? The best is yet to come. This is beautiful, right? He says, listen, in the twinkle of an eye at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound, and the dead who are in the graves, will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. I'll be changed. You'll be changed. We'll be changed forever. Why? Because the best is yet to come. There is more to come in this life. And your life has to change. A new life is coming. A new body is coming. New opportunities are coming. New challenges are coming. New worlds are coming. Everything is coming because we're going to be like Jesus. And I want this to be a source of encouragement and strength. Why? Because you're about to face the most difficult lesson 
which is lesson number four. The most difficult lesson that you're going to have today is this. You're going to be tested in life. You're going to be tested. See, there's two kinds of people, John says, that live in this world. The first kind of people are this, right? There's two kinds of people. Those who practice, which means just simply their way of life, what dominates their life, what dominates their habits, what dominates their thinking, what dominates their belief system, is sin, right? Those could be physical sins. Those could be sins of the brain, right? It could be any kind of sin, right? Sin is ultimately unbelief. It's just simply not trusting in God. So their way of life is they simply don't trust God. They don't trust Jesus, right? Now watch this. First John chapter 3, verse 4. Everyone who makes a what? Practice of sinning. That means my whole way of life is I simply don't trust God, right? I'm breaking the law. And in fact, sin is lawlessness. That's all it is. is you're, you're, when you break the first commandment, having other gods, you break them all. Okay? And so he says, this is your way of life. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 says, whoever makes a practice of sinning, guess what? You're of the devil. That means your dominant relationship in your life is not Jesus, it's, it's, it's the devil. And the devil is the one who has been doing this from the very beginning, and you're just falling in line with him. That's the first kind. The second kind is those who practice a way of life called righteousness. Those who practice the, what's, what's called a way of life of righteousness. That means to walk in the way of Jesus. To trust Jesus for everything. To walk in His steps and his, and his way of life. Doing what is right. And the right thing to do is to believe in Him. 1 John chapter 2, verse 29 says, If you know that He is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of Him. Your new life is in Him. 1 John chapter 3, verse 7 says, The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as Jesus is. These two groups reflect a very simple truth. Who are children of God and who are not children of God? If you've ever wondered, am I a child of God or I'm something else, right? Do I belong to the family or do I not? Here's the answer. 1 John chapter 3, verse 10. Very, very plain and simple. Here's what he says. This is how we know we're children of God. How do you know you belong to the family, right? Who are the children of God? He says, this is how you know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are, right? He says this. Anyone who does not practice righteousness and at the core of that is to practice righteousness is to trust Christ for everything, right? That's the, that's the core of practicing righteousness, right? Is not a child of God. Nor is anyone who doesn't love. Because when you trust Christ, ultimately you love. That's the fruit. How do you know if you're a child of God or you're a child of something else? Do you practice righteousness? Do you trust Christ for everything? Do you believe in Him as your righteousness? Do you live out a righteous life? Who are you? And so because of this, right, we're going to find ourselves in conflict. We're going to be tested in this life. And watch the test. Here it is, verse 7. Dear children, don't let anyone lead you, and let's all say it together both here and at home, don't lead you what? Astray. Don't let anyone deceive you. I've said this before, but I want to make sure I'm clear. The world is designed to lead you astray. Everything in this world is designed to lead you away from your relationship with God. The world has fallen. The world is under the control and reign and rule of the prince of power of evil. That's why God's kingdom is not of this world. Everything is designed in this fallen way 
to lead you away from God, to lead you away from what is right and true and good, to lead you to not believe and place your trust in Christ. There will always be something in this world trying to pull you away. There will always be something in this world that will tempt you to turn away from God. There will always be something in this world that wants you to reject the living God. That's why Paul, John says, don't let anyone, don't let anything lead you away from your relationship with Jesus. Which is why the most important lesson not to forget is number five. I heard a beautiful story. It's a lesson I want all of you to learn. Make your bed in the morning. The first thing you do is make your bed in the morning. This is William, Admiral William McRaven, and his commencement address to the University of Texas, go Longhorns, right? shared one of the most important life lessons you can ever have if you want to be successful. He said this, always make your bed first thing in the morning. And here's the quote. If you make your bed every morning, you'll accomplish the first task of the day. It will give you a small sense of pride. It'll encourage you to do another task and another and another. Making your bed will also reinforce the fact that little things in life actually matter. If you can't do the little things right, you can't do the big things right. And if by chance you have a miserable day, at least you get to come home to a bed made. You can come home to a bed made. And that will be the encouragement that you need for tomorrow to be better. If you want to change the world, start by making your bed. I think that's an incredible life lesson. But here's the thing. It's not the most important one. It's not the most important. No offense to Admiral McRaven, even though he is a Longhorn, and even though he gave his commencement speech at the University of Texas, the most important lesson that we can learn each day of our lives before making our bed is this. Never stop clinging to Jesus. Never stop clinging to Jesus. Can we all say it together? Never stop clinging to Jesus. Watch this. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. And now, little children, abide in Jesus. I love that word abide. Great hymn of faith was written, abide in me. Abide is just a beautiful word that means this, cling to. A modern way of looking at it is this, when a child gives their parent a bear hug when they walk into the door, that's abide. What God invites you to do today in the most important life lesson that you will ever have from your Father in heaven is this, you cling to Jesus so that when he appears you have incredible confidence why because you're just wrapped in him you're bear hugging him you're holding on to him so tight that nothing can ever separate you from him that nothing can tear you away from him that nothing can deceive you or help you to or cause you to fall away from him right never stop clinging to Jesus when I think about the last 20 years of ministry, I think my entire 20 years is summed up with that one phrase. My whole joy in life is inviting people just to cling to Jesus. Don't ever stop clinging to Him. Why? Because number one, He is the one who takes away your sins. He takes away my sins. He takes away our sins, right? Sometimes, I'll be honest, I feel like a broken record. Why? Because I tell you the same thing every week. Jesus is the one who takes away your sins. Jesus is the one who forgives your sins. Jesus is the one who makes you new. And I always feel sometimes like a broken record, but then I heard this beautiful quote from Martin Luther because he was accused of the exact same thing. He said, Dr. Luther, why do you say the same thing every single week? And his response to the people who asked him was this. Here's why because you forget it every single week. We forget it. 1 John chapter 3 says this, but you know that He appeared so that He might do what? 
take away our sins. Because in in Jesus there is no sin. So I'm going to cling to the one who takes away my failures. I'm going to cling to the one who takes away my mistakes. I'm going to cling to the one who takes away all the stupid things that run through my head, all the hurtful words I've ever said, all the failures I've committed with my hands, all the things I've left undone and the promises not kept. I'm going to cling to Him. Number two, I'm going to cling to the one who destroys the devil's work. The devil is actively working in this world to do one thing. Rip you away from Jesus. That's it. He'll do anything and everything. He'll either tell you you can't trust him. He'll tell you that he won't forgive you. you he'll tell you that you, you, there's no way he can love you unconditionally. Or you know what he'll do? He'll make your life so comfortable that you don't need him. Why do I need him? Everything's good. Family's good. House is good. Job is good. Money in the bank. I got cars. Got everything I need. What do I need him for? The devil's work is to convince you that you don't need Jesus and that Jesus doesn't need you. But look what John says. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. So if I'm going to cling to someone, I'm not going to cling to the one who's sent to destroy me. I'm going to cling to the one who's destroying him. I'm going to cling to the one who destroys the devil's lies, who destroys the devil's temptations, who destroys the devil's evil. I'm going to cling to him, and I'm never going to let go. I'm never going to let go. But I'm also, I'm going to cling to the one who changes our life. I'm going to cling to the one who changes my life. If there's one thing that I've learned, and I've learned a lot of things over the last 45 years of spending with Jesus, but the one thing that always I keep coming back to is this. He's just changed my life. Pure and simple. He's changed my life. He's changed the way I think about this world. He's changed my heart and the way it loves. He's changed my attitudes and my actions. He's changed my words. He's changed how I think about things. He's just changed my life. And he's always, now watch this. He's always changed it for the better. Not maybe the easier, but for the better. And if I'm going to cling to anyone... I'm going to cling to the one who makes it better. The devil wants you to cling to him because he's going to make it easier. But it may be worse, and it will be worse. I'm going to cling to the one who makes my life better. Now, it may be harder. It may be more challenging. There may be difficult moments. There may be struggles. There may be ups and downs, and there will be. But you better believe, I'm going to cling to the one who changes my life for the better because there's more to come and he loves me let's pray God thank you so much that you give us Jesus and in Jesus we have something to wrap our arms around to hold on to that when everything in this world is, 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 is not going well, or everything in this world is de- you know, causing a delusion of our heart and mind, I can just cling to Jesus. If there's any lesson I'm going to learn today, it's to cling to Jesus. If there's any lesson I'm going to take away, it's to cling to Jesus. Why? Because you love me. And when the world misunderstands me, you understand me. And what you have for me is something better to come. And yes, I'm going to be tested. And yes, I'm going to be tried. And yes, there's going to be challenges. But you are right there. You are my hope and righteousness. You cover me. And I know I can cling to you because you're the one who takes away my sin. You destroy my enemies before me. And you change me. You change me. And I want to be changed. 
In Jesus' name. And we all said together, church, amen.